welcome to the Elements of Whiskey, the podcast. We are a weekly Dutch whiskey podcast where we occasionally interview some people working in the whiskey industry. As in this episode, we had a very great conversation with Scott uh, from the Tomaten Distillery from Kubokan. And we found it was so, so amazing that we just had to share it with you. So this special episode in English uh, where we to talk with Scott. My name is Max and I'm a whiskey host. And My name is Lucia and I'm also here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a beginner to the whiskey. Um, and I'll be asking Scott some of the simpler questions while Max later on will get more complex and geeky with him regarding the whiskey making process. Yes, and we talked about so many things. So if you ever wondered what makes Tomaten, Tomaten and Kubokan something completely different and why it's an experimental, lightly peated single malt, this is the right episode for you. Just sit back, if you have a bottle at home, pour yourself a glass and enjoy. Welcome to our podcast of the Elements of Whiskey. Today we have a very, very special guest. Uh, Scott, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm Scott Adamson. I'm the Global Brand Ambassador at Tomatin Distillery, and that means that I cover all of our brands, including Kubokan, that we're going to talk about today. And I also work on the, the cask selection blending side of things, so have a front row seat in how these products are made as well. So I'm really looking forward to, to sharing a dram and chatting to you about them. So this delicious, I assume, delicious dram, which I see now has no sticker on it for me. Thank you, Max. Uh <laughs> Kubakan, you said, and it has your fingerprints on it then. It does a little bit, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm very fortunate. Kubakan at its core is quite an experimental single malt brand and I'm allowed to get involved in that from selecting the cask types that we're going to mature the spirit in and then picking how we're going to marry those cask types together to get the best single malt possible. But Signature that we're trying today, Signature has been in production since 2005 and we, we first launched it in 2013. So the recipe here, the whiskey that we're going to try here, that predates my time there but I, i'm still involved in bringing that to life that's lovely it smells very good i'm already sniffing yeah, a bit but before i try it i want to get uh some questions in first so kubakan uh is a very unusual name for what apparently also is an unusual spirit where does this name come from do you know yes yeah, so, so, so the name came from a, a local kind of myth um, mm. In Gaelic, ku means dog and bokken means spirit or ghost. And there, there is a local myth that a, a ghost dog haunts the local area. Now, when we first launched the brand, that was a big part of the story. But now, since since we rebranded in 2019, the focus is now far more on the liquid inside the bottle. And we just use that, that Kubok name as part of the legacy of the brand. I love it. I love, I love dogs. I love <laughs> uh, uh, stories. I love mythology. We've done a bunch of episodes on that. <laughs> previously so i love this whiskey even more now and also as our audience can see here there is this beautiful bottle with this very nice intricate design can you tell us a bit more about that yeah so we rebranded kubok in, in 2019 um and what we wanted to do was kubokin is a lightly peated single malt and i think our old packaging uh, it was a black box with a big puff of blue smoke on the front i think it may be conveyed that the whiskey within was a heavily peated single malt and mm -hmm. that wasn't really uh, doing the, the liquid justice. So in 2019, when we went through the rebrand process, we wanted something that told the story of the liquid inside the bottle. So first of all, as you mentioned, it is beautiful, as is the whiskey inside. But what we're trying to do with the design here is kind of show that interaction between smoke and oak. And there's this lovely thing when you turn the bottle around slowly, it does look like that little light touch of smoke is going up. And then the lines on the bottle are to reflect the influence of oak on our whiskey. One of my favorite elements of the packaging, though, is actually on the, the carton itself. And I don't know how well everyone can see this that's, that's viewing, but there are small little black specks throughout the substrate of the packaging. And that was our uh, designer in Edinburgh got a hold of a briquette of peat and they pulverized it into small, small particles 
so that it could be laid throughout the packaging, which is really, really cool. Um, my favourite bit about that was when a designer from Edinburgh was trying to source Highland peat and all they could find was people looking to sell them pallets of the stuff that would last in a fire for, for months. And he was just saying, no, I, I need one, one, one. <laughs> brick of peat. So I had to go and source that and send it down to them. All right. So I've been smelling a bit. I like it. It's it's nice. It's a, it's a bit grassy, a bit flowery. It's, um, yeah. it's very soft, very sweet. Yeah. I so like so what we have here, this is Kubok and Signature. And this is the, the single malt that the brand in, in many ways has been built around. So and a little the... bit of the backstory is we only first started making peated spirit back in 2005. And when we first produced that, our distillery manager filled some bourbon barrels, some virgin oak casks and some Oloroso sherry casks. So eight years later in 2013, when we wanted to release a product from this peated spirit, the best place to go was to those original three cask types, marry them together and create this recipe. So what we have here, there is that little gentle, gentle touch of smoke it is mm. for me the way i like to describe it is the smoke is not the main ingredient it's like the seasoning yeah. that pulls all the other flavors together it's like the salt and pepper on the dish the bourbon barrels give a huge waft of that love lovely sweetness that vanilla that coconut really comes through there the virgin oak adds a little bit more spice particularly on the palate and then the sherry almost gives us like a smoked paprika and some dried fruits coming through but it is it's a surprisingly sweet spirit for something that is made with lightly peated barley it's very nice and indeed the smoke comes through at the very end i feel barely in smell in the taste it does it's it's very subtle it's indeed yeah it's it's the the garnish on the <laughs> on the whiskey so to say and Absolutely. i've heard that this is the only spirit in your core range is that right yeah so with kubakin we have signature which is our only core ongoing expression in the brand at the moment. But around that, we have a series of limited batch releases called The Creations. And so as I mentioned, Kubalkin at its core has been about experimentation. We, we take that lightly peated barley, we distill it for only one week in the winter. That gives us our new make spirit. And then we put it into a wide variety of different casks. And the three main casks are still the bourbon, the virgin American oak, and the sherry that we use for signature. But around that we have access to some of the most incredible and rare casks in the world that we can then create limited products from. So Creation 1 and 2, which were launched in 2019 at the time of the rebrand, really typify that. So Creation 1 uses Kubokin that's been matured in Imperial Stout casks from the Black Isle Brewery, which is a local brewery to us, and nice. Moscatel casks from a winery in Portugal. So it's this mixture of sweet dessert wine with lots of orange flavors, and then that bitter hoppy beer, and it works wonderfully well together. That and then creation too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic for me. It, it's a whiskey that reminds me of my honeymoon. <laughs> we went on honeymoon to Rome, and oh. every morning we would we we stayed in a bed and breakfast, and we would go downstairs every morning and have our breakfast on one of the busy streets in Rome, uh, just sitting at a little cafe. And every morning we would have a, a double espresso and a pastry with like an apricot jam in the middle. And it was that mixture of that that jam marmalade flavour, the sweet buttery pastry, and then that bitter espresso. It, it, it just really takes me back to that in, in Creation One there, nice. and then Creation. Two, Two, we became the first distillery in Scotland to use Japanese shochu casks. So, oh. uh, so that was a really cool thing as well. That sounds nice. That sounds very cool. Hey, uh, Max, uh, can we can we get one of those nice uh, Creation One bottles, perhaps? This means that I need to go shopping again. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Are they still available, Scott? They will be coming towards the end of their kind of time. Mm -hmm. um, you, you might still be able to find them in some specialist retailers, but we are about to, well, on the 24th of January, launch Creation 3 and 4. So with it being the new year, it's almost a little bit of that out with the old, in with the new yes. type of thing going on with Kubokin right now. All right. Looking forward to those then, if they yeah. are in any way as, as nice as the creation one and two sound and they're, they're certainly as, as interesting and uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate i've got a bottle of each of them on front of me right now it's already <laughs> produced it's in package waiting to go out but with creation three we mm. were using some moroccan red wine casks 
and um, we're mixing those casks with American rye. So it's really this taste of Morocco. It's that red fruits from the from the wine and it's the spices from the rye casks. So really, really exciting there. And then Creation 4 is two of Europe's most revered drinks. It's port and cognac casks married together. So with Kubokin, we're, we're almost taking, you know, for the last 10, maybe even 20 years, the whiskey industry has experimented with a wide variety of cask types. But what we're doing with Kubokin is taking the information we've learned over that time and then marrying the flavours together. So rather than just showing what one cask type can do, it's how can we use that flavour and what can we marry it with? And it kind of goes back to what we did with Signature with the three cask types, trying to get the better flavour, try and create something that is better than the sum of its parts. That sounds amazing. That sounds wonderful. You mentioned something about distilling only one week in winter. So is that is that like your Christmas gift or how how does this work? Why do you do that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. So so j- just for clarity, Kubokin is produced at Tomatin Distillery and Tomatin Distillery has been producing since 1897. And interestingly enough, up until the 1960s, the vast majority of the spirit made at Tomatin would have been peated. But then from the 1960s onwards, and and that goes for the Highlands as a whole. From the 1960s onwards, there was a massive move away from smoky spirits in the Highlands and Speyside into that light, fruity style that Tomatin is now known for. Um, and Tomatin is absolutely the the, the, the big brand that is our, our core brand. And so we produce that all year round. But then since 2005, we've dedicated the last week of production every year to laying down this lightly peated spirit. Um, and the reason that we do it in winter is because the water at that time of the year is so much colder and it allows us to create a slightly more oily, more viscous body of spirit, which works really well with that sort of smoky, peaty thing going on there. So um, yeah, so for the last one to two weeks every year, We'll, we'll turn production from tomato to kabakan. Nice. That sounds really cool. And I think Max will go into that later with you a bit, you know, the comparison in production process between Tomatin and Kubokan, because uh, the two differ, I understood. Yeah, um, yeah they're, they're massively different the whole way mm-hmm. through. And those those details in distilling, in you know, only using this one or two weeks in winter, uh, a very set time, using a different process, is that also why it is such an unusual spirit then? Yeah, I, th- I think there's a few things going into that. So th- I think the first one, yeah, that, that time of year is massively important. And mm. I I can't think of many distilleries that only make a spirit for two weeks of the year and then do something else for the whole time. So that's quite unusual. Me but neither. I think what is unusual and at its core is that nowadays most Highland spirits are not peated. Most Highland spirits are quite fruity, are, mm-hmm. are quite elegant, are quite rounded. Mm-hmm. Um, so bringing back that kind of historical distillation process, and as I'm speaking to Max, we'll jump into that in much more detail, but bringing back that historical style of production, but then marrying that with a very, very modern approach to maturation. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the unusual lies. It's this marriage of history and really up-to-date maturation. I like that very much. I like how you're sort of paying homage to the history of of the Highlands and the distillery. I just have a few more questions before you can get all geeky with Max about the whiskey. The distillery itself, so you are the brand ambassador. Are there any other, I mean, of course, there are other people on board on the distillery. You don't run it by yourself. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Who Who is the distillery manager? Absolutely, yeah. So the, the distillery is located 15 miles to the south of Inverness and geographically it puts no it way. right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right in the heart of the Scottish Highlands. So so it, it, it's, it's a really interesting place because it was the first distillery in the Highlands that was built away from the coast. It was built in 1897 as the Highland Railway line was completed. So rather than needing the water to get your whiskey to the market, we used the railway and it means that we're 315 metres above sea level, right in the heart of the Scottish Highlands. The problem with that is that most Highland communities are coastal. So when the distillery was built, the founders had to build a handful of cottages on site as well. And as the distillery expanded, so has the number of houses. So Tomatin today is the last distillery in Scotland that still provides accommodation for all of its workforce, for the majority of its workforce. 
So more than half of the people that work at the distillery live on site. Across the company, I believe the team is about 60 people. And that's everything from production to the visitor centre to sales and marketing, all the way up to the managing director. Um, and we're based at the distillery. Our, our head office is, is on site at the distillery. So there's this real connection with the spirit, both from a work point of view and also from a, a community point of view. And so, yeah, our, our master distiller is a, a gentleman called Graham Yunson. Graham uh, originally started his career in 1990 at Scapa Distillery. He then moved to Glendronach. From Glendronach, he moved to Glenmorangie and he became mm. the distillery manager at Glenmorangie for a decade. He uh, He's responsible for reopening Glen, uh, Glen Glassach Distillery. He brought that back to life. And then in 2011, he came to Taratin and he's now uh, our master distiller. Um, and so from him, it's this trickle down. We've got the, the, the production team. We've got the warehousing team. We've got our own cooperage on site. Mm. Um, there's myself working as the, the brand ambassador, but we've got a marketing team, a sales team, um, all, all based at the distillery at Tomatin. Nice. That's very nice. And so there's there's a bunch of cottages on site, you said. Uh, a couple of the, the workers are housed there. That's, do they, do, yeah, that's do correct. they bring so their families got... or is it like a, like a student commuting yeah. uh, to and from their family on the weekend? Or? No, no. No, it's that that becomes people's home for their life. Oh, wow. um, so, so we have 30 cottages at the distillery and they're all occupied by production workers and their family. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about that is that unlike some places where people maybe go and work there for a couple of years to bolster their CV and move mm -hmm. to somewhere else, yeah. th these people will stay at the distillery their, their whole life. So we've got members of staff who have been working with us for 45 years, 40 years, 30 wow. years. Their sons and daughters work in the distillery and um, their cousins work in the distillery so it, it really is this kind of a, a community that just happens to center around a distillery which is really cool i love that that's amazing max we need to move to scotland uh <laughs> i'm kidding don't worry i think from my side those are all my questions anything else you want to talk about before you go on uh chatting with max no i think i think let's let's get into the the nitty gritty into the details now all right i'll let you two have fun then all right thank you uh, okay. Lois Scotch. so now it's my turn to uh, to have a little uh, chat with you lucia is also very like in, in, interested in the whole story behind uh, like the distillery itself and the whiskey but to be honest i'm going to make it a little bit harder for you and just give you some uh, some harder questions i just really want to talk really quickly through the whole process of your like making whiskey and i want to have like all the little details about it because i'm interested because like i'm always wondering like if i hear stories like okay we distill only the last week in in, in winter or in the year or and i'm like this is very cool as a storytelling perspective but does it actually do anything so that's some some stuff that i want to talk about with you i just want to really know like which is like storytelling and which actually involves it, like changes the flavor so we we start with the water you said like yeah. The, the temperature of the water is a very important part. Why is it? So what will happen there in, in the winter, the water is up just above freezing point the whole time. Okay. And, and throughout the year, the temperature of our water source, our water source is a soft water source. It is a, a surface water source. It's a stream called the Altna Freeth. Okay. So it is exposed to the elements. It lands on the mountains just above the distillery and then comes down to the distillery. So in the summer, when, when it's hot outside, that mm -hmm. water, will be warmer okay in the winter especially in december when we make the stuff that that water is just above freezing point now okay. where that comes into importance in the production of kubokin is in the condensers so okay. as the as we're distilling and the vapor has traveled up over the neck of, mm -hmm. of the still and out through the line arm it comes into the condenser unit and we're using shell and tube condensers there. Okay. And because the water that is going into that shell and tube condenser is so much colder, mm -hmm. it means that the vapor condenses quicker than it would if the water was warmer. Yeah, exactly. And what that, what that allows to happen is to create a slightly heavier, slightly more oily spirit um, All right. at the end because it's condensed quicker. All right, so it's mostly in the condensing part because like I was wondering like if you're going to make your like your mesh, you actually are using warm water. No, like no yeah. matter what the water source is, you need to heat it up to extract all the sugars and enzymes of it. So like why yeah. would you use cold water when it's in the, in the condensing part? I will yeah. get back to distilling because that's way later on in the line. Yeah, um, of course. You also are proud to say like we use Scottish barley. This is very, very important because like we know that 
that like a lot of very big brands with like a big production capacity need to buy like from the mainland like buy barley so you guys use 100 scottish barley yeah how much do we know about this like the barley or like where it came from or is it like you also like sort of buying it in bulk or do you exactly know which farmer planted the seeds at which point yeah so we work on long contracts with our barley supplier which okay. is simpsons down and at simpsons and baird so two two different suppliers we work with both of those guys okay. and so because of those long contracts and because of their traceability we are able to if we wanted to look at a batch of barley look at the reference code that we have on it and go mm -hmm. all the way back to seed um all right and and know exactly what has been used on that field which is really important uh -huh. but what's really cool about kubokin now especially this year so up until this year we have used the the kind of the, the barley variety that has been used for single malt production at, at the time so it would be things like concerto or laureate yeah. um this year for the first time kubokin was produced 100 with golden promise oh wow okay. um, and golden promise is one of these heritage barley varieties and so we know that this barley has been grown on farms just to the north of dundee um on the east coast of scotland because we had to source from a farmer that is still producing golden promise all right like for for our dutch speaking audiences uh, we we did an episode completely talking about grains and like all the different strains in this episode we also looked at yields like how much pure alcohol we get from how much uh, like tons of like barley golden promise isn't exactly the one which you should use if you want to get a really nice big batch to say the yeah, least. yeah yeah well it's true enough so the the way barley has developed is you know i think something that is at the core of whiskey production has always been striving for efficiency it's maybe not the most romantic thing but that has been at the core of whiskey production since at least 1823 when the kind of the, the rules of how a distillery should run have been set out mm -hmm. and a big part of that is getting the maximum yield from your tonnage of barley so it's liters per ton is the way we calculate it you're normally looking between 400 to 420 liters of alcohol per ton of barley as your yield golden promise being a heritage barley variety should give us some problems in that and when we were going through the process of selecting it we did a cost analysis and kind of outlined how much more it's going to cost per liter firstly on the fact that golden promise per ton is more expensive than these modern varieties because there's only so many places that grow it um and then secondly on the fact that we're going to lose alcohol because mm -hmm of the lower yield. Yeah. I was speaking to our distillery manager um, just before we, we closed for the holidays there, just as the Kubokin production came to an end. And she was blown away by how good the Golden Promise had performed. I think she was talking about 408 litres uh, per tonne. So oddly enough, it's I don't know what's happened. I don't know how the distilleries, maybe there's a calculation <laughs> gone wrong, but it's looking like that this has performed really, really well from a yield perspective but more importantly for a, a brand like Kubokin it's performed exceptionally well from a quality point of view okay. it has this lovely mouthfeel it's got this real depth of multi characteristics so mm -hmm. it's giving us a lot all right what I'm, i'm i'm just wondering right now we are talking about a lightly peated whiskey lightly doesn't doesn't like it yes it's not extremely heavily peated okay but what is your definition of a lightly peated and in size of like transparency and like knowing stuff do you guys measure like stuff like like the the fennel ppm or stuff like that and what is a lightly peated highland yeah whiskey? so I, i think it's interesting because i think we've got to go back and look at what ppm is and ppm yeah. is the parts per million of phenols mm -hmm. in the barley and phenols are this family of flavor compounds um so you'll get aromas like smoke you'll get maybe that medicinal side and they all come under this phenol banner mm -hmm. um and and ppm measures that how many of those compounds, compounds are yeah. per million per million yeah and that's all great that tells you what's in the barley mm -hmm. but what that does not tell you is the fact that every distillery performs differently yeah And so something that would be considered heavily peated at one distillery might not be so heavily peated at another distillery. And I'll yeah. give you a great example. So when we first started making Kubokin and, and distilling this spirit back in 2005, the barley that we were buying was coming in at 15 ppm, okay. 1.5. 
Um, and I would say that is a likely peated barley. I would say yeah. for me, anything between like two and twenty is quite Lovely. light. Yeah. And we used that barley all the way up until 2012, mm -hmm. and then we decided to experiment with the the barley peating and and find out you know what happens if we do 40 ppm, what happens if we do 30 ppm, and we've done that. And what's really incredible is that 40 ppm is where I would start to get to heavy. That's where you're getting to the numbers of likes of Lafroy and Lagavulin and Ardbeg, maybe a little bit higher for them. Yeah. But it's around about that you're getting into that ballpark. Mm -hmm. What was really interesting is in the spirit that smoke, that peat does not come across at our distillery. And I think okay. the reason for that is what you're, what we're effectively doing is making a lightly peated whiskey in a distillery that is designed to create a light, fruity, floral spirit. So, so the distillery is designed to create the, uh, to create tomatin. And tomatin is a light, it's an elegant, it's a very complex spirit, but at its core, it's fruity. So when we then run peated barley through it, whether it's 15 ppm or 40 ppm, the still shape, the way we run the still, it's designed to remove a lot of those heavier flavor compounds, mm -hmm. which phenols are. Yeah. So even when we produce something that's 40 ppm, if we were to take that barley and take it over to uh, Lafroy, they would create a much heavier yeah. spirit than we do. So I don't think ppm of barley is a fair way to really assess how peated or non-peated uh, a whiskey will be. So for us, we go purely by nose and taste. And that's difficult because it's not empirical. There's, it's, yeah. there's not a number. True. And it would be great to be able to say, okay, this is level one peat, level yeah. two peat, level three peat, level four, level five. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't do that because it's so subjective as well. Yeah, no, def no definitely. Because the thing is, I like to consider myself uh, as, as, as one of the, the peat heads, really are looking for this very densely heavy peat smoke where it's always like the, the higher the number the better but pretty recently there is a distillery that that i've noticed that put two ppm levels on their bottle the first being the ppm level in the malted barley and also a ppm level from the final product or at least from the the, the, the new make spirit and, and and this gives me like this very helpful insight that you lose a lot of this these these high numbers these high values when uh, distilling and, and as you you mentioned like the shape of the still and the way you you distill it changes this but are there any uh, experiments being done by blending uh, different ppm levels do you know anything about like what is happening when i take a very uh, lightly peated whiskey and a very highly peated whiskey and i combine them yeah, i think that's a great question and i think to illustrate that the Kubok and Creation 2 is a great example. Okay. So Creation 2 is a combination of two cask types. It's 85%, roughly 85% matured in those Japanese shochu casks. Mm -hmm. And that was spirit that was laid down in 2012. Okay. So 2012 was the last year of that 15 ppm. The final 15% is European virgin oak mm -hmm. from 2014. And in 2014, our ppm was around about 30 to 35 ppm. So it's twice the peat content of the 2012 okay. spirit. Yeah. And what I would say is that this is absolutely the, the quote unquote smokiest Kubokin that we've released. That doesn't mean that it's a heavily smoky whiskey. It's relative to the fact that everything's quite lightly peated, but you get that coming across more. What I find interesting, though, is trying those two spirits side by side, I'm getting more smoke from the lightly peated barley, the, the 2012 okay. 15 ppm, than I am from the 2014 30 ppm. And the reason is the cask type. So Japanese shochu, mm -hmm. those are casks that have held another spirit. There's not a huge amount of oak influence. So what you're getting is the development of the spirit spirit yes. whereas with the european virgin oak you get this massive assault of, of flavor yeah. from from the wood itself so that it almost masks the smoke so all right even if even if you talk about that two different levels of peat the thing to bear in mind is the interaction of the different cask types we're using as well okay you've mentioned it uh, and and we'll get back to the second part of like making uh, the whiskey but you mentioned this briefly there are two new creations been released i believe two weeks ago please t tell me like creation three and four 
These are the, the new ones. To give a little peek behind the curtains, of course, we record this before the moment, so I don't have a bottle sitting here next to me, which, uh, Scott, is a shame. We need to do something about that. But what is the Creations Tree? What is what is that about? Creations at their core mm-hmm. are all about making flavor, and okay. they're all about finding the, the individual flavors that different cask types will give us, and then blending them together in a way that gives us something that really completes them. So Creation 3, I have it here, yeah. and you'll see tremendous color of whiskey as well. Wow. All yeah. natural color, all non-chill filters, all 46%. Uh-huh. What we've done here is we've used a combination of Moroccan Cabernet Sauvignon casks. Okay. Uh, so red wine from the Fez region of Morocco, French oak casks that have held... Moroccan red wine mm-hmm. and those have given us wonderful wonderful red berries almost like a strawberry with a balsamic glaze kind of flavor really really interesting I'm, and I'm, then my wine can is, isn't like my wine knowledge isn't this big but what makes a Moroccan wine stand out from like an, an, an French or an Italian or an European red wine yeah I mean I, I must admit I'm not the, the biggest <laughs> wine knowledge guy myself and I've not spent a huge amount of time drinking Moroccan wine All right. um, but it's, it's those Cabernet Sauvignon grapes All right. produced in, grown in Morocco with that different soil type, different climate, but it's still Mediterranean, you know. So okay, if yeah. you look at Spain and uh, Italy, they're on the Mediterranean. Morocco is as well. It just happens to be in Africa. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, so, you know, trying the Moroccan red wine casks, for me, there was a lightness to them okay. compared to French Cabernet Sauvignon casks that I've used in the past. Now, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily what the wine is like. It's just what the spirit coming out of those casks did. So for me, there was a rose water and that strawberry element from the Moroccan red wine casks that really worked incredibly well with the, the Kubok and spirit. And then that kind of gave us a, a thought, you know, can we create the flavors of a Moroccan souk, you know, the, okay. those Moroccan markets mm-hmm. in a whiskey? And so we thought, well, what did what do they have? They've got all these red fruits that mm-hmm. we have from the Moroccan wine cask, but something they have in abundance is spice. Yeah. And we thought, where better to get a spicy element into our whiskey than from American rye whiskey. casks? Yeah. And American rye has all of these lovely spice-driven notes. And so... We've used those casks in here as well. We've married that rye and Moroccan wine to give that overall impression of walking through a market in Morocco. Really interesting. But that is only number three. We also got number four. We've also got number four, yeah. You have the bottle in front of you? Yeah, I've got this one in front of me as well. Number four, again, beautiful, beautiful liquid here. So number four. Number four is something we've been kind of thinking of for a while. We wanted to have a Kubalkin that used port casks. We love port casks. It works really, really well with all of the spirit that we produce. And we work with the Symington family over in Portugal for our port casks. And it's tawny port pipes that have held port for around about 50 years before they get to us. So huge amounts of flavor there. And in this spirit, it gives us almost like a plum jam. And there's like um, almost like a spiced chocolate flavor from the port matured whiskey. And then to that, we've added cognac casks, that classic French spirit. Cognac casks are something we've really only been experimenting with for the last 10 years. Okay. But the results have been incredible. Lots of floral flavors, lots of um, freshly baked uh, kind of pastry notes coming from those casks as well. And what's really cool is I was reading um, an old cocktail book called Jigger Beaker Glass. And there's a cocktail in there called the Antrim Cocktail. Okay. And the Antrim Cocktail is very simply a mix of of cognac and port together. And we thought, you know, we can do that with these casks and create the trifecta of of drinks, you know, scotch whiskey, cognac and port, tawny port. Just, it all sounds beautiful and when we when we got the recipe right, when we got the the contents right, we were blown away by the results. I'm really looking forward on these new creations, but I want to get back to the to to the, the matter at hand, making this whiskey. We've talked about the water, the malted barley and the peat. Something that I think that is quite often overlooked is 
the usage of yeast and fermentation, or at least it's yeah. not it's not overlooked because it's I, I imagine for you guys a very important part, but it's not something that is discussed that often. So let's let's change that up a little bit. Uh, what 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 do you can tell me about like the yeast and fermentation times, and also like how you guys been experimenting with it, yeah. or that it's just basically just using the knowledge you have from making whiskey the rest of the year and just carrying it over just to have this solid base like which which way do you swing yeah yeah no i I think that's a you're absolutely right it's a part of the discussion that you know if you go to a winery in france Mm -hmm. one of the things they talk about the most is the fermentation yep yep. and you come to scotland where you have 150 distilleries and they all use the same three ingredients, but we only talk about two of them. You know, it's it's. Yeah. Um, but I I think what's yeast itself is absolutely important. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, distilleries are all using a distiller's yeast. Mm-hmm. You know, we're at Tomatum, we're using MG Maori uh, MG plus Maori yeast. It's a distiller's yeast. Mm-hmm. But what I think is really important is to separate the yeast that we use and the process of fermentation. Okay. Because yeast is one microorganism. Mm-hmm. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, to give it the full name, is one microorganism. Mm-hmm. And the goal of that microorganism is to consume the sugars that exist in our wort yep. from the mash mm-hmm. and convert them into alcohol. But as well as that, you'll get congeners of so flavor compounds. You'll get heat and you'll get carbon dioxide. Yeah. But f- f- what we're trying to do as distillers is use the yeast to hijack the sugar and create alcohol. Mm -hmm. Now, that function of yeast creating alcohol, that finishes at 48 hours. At that point in time, the yeast cells start to die Mm -hmm. and they'll go away. Now, in that first 48 hours, the yeast is the dominant microorganism in the fermentation. It is leading the dance. It's doing everything. Mm -hmm. But there are are hundreds and thousands of other microorganisms in that liquid Mm -hmm. and they will be suppressed for that first 48 hours but as the yeast dies they start to flourish and they start to have their own little interactions Mm -hmm. and at tomatin and it extends to kubokin production we have the longest standard fermentation in scotland our fermentation is one full week long oh, wow. so seven days and I, I believe that is around about 168 hours if if my maths is correct but it's it's a long period of time you know mm-hmm. uh, for for most people when they talk about a long fermentation they're talking about 80 to 100 hours so ours is twice as long as a, a long fermentation mm-hmm. and during that time all of these other microorganisms are allowed to interact and develop chemicals and flavor compounds and they will change the flavor of the wash and what we get is this it's called late lactic acid bacteria and they create incredibly fruity flavors in the wash Mm -hmm. so just before we shut down for the end of the year i was down at the distillery while we were making kubok and um, really really excited to see how this golden promise worked so i was speaking to the mash uh, guys and they were saying that it was thicker but it was draining well so that was all good mm-hmm. then went through to the the ton room and I, I i was able to try one of the washes at that 48 hour mark and it was very very barley led it was very malty it uh-huh. had that kind of silage um funky barley flavors which are really lovely i then tried it at 150 hours and there was do you remember when you were a, a kid going to the beach and you would get a solero ice lolly yeah <laughs> that, yes. that passion fruit uh-huh. ice lolly that passion fruit and vanilla as soon as i opened the wash back up that was the flavor that i was met with this massive burst of tropical fruit mm-hmm. with the smoke it was almost like if you were to take some pineapple and put it on a barbecue yes that was the smell that we were getting off the wash back and that is all because of this long fermentation that we use and you say like it's like you ferment like seven days like long how many like fermentation tons do you guys have to 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 facilitate all these like because i can't imagine like you you, you wait seven days until perhaps something happens yeah so we have 12 and wow. what happens is we will do 12 mashes a week. So it's a balanced system that we have at the distillery, and it works out really well. We will do one mash, mm-hmm. and we will put that all the liquid from that first mash into washback number one. Okay. And that will sit there for seven days. Mm-hmm. And then after that, that will fill three of our six wash stills. Okay. Um, we will wait until 
all of the wash stills are empty. So we'll take wash back number one and wash back number two, mm -hmm. and we'll pump them through to the still house and they'll fill all six of our wash stills. And once that's distilled and collected and mixed with the feints and the four shots from the previous run, mm -hmm. um, that will be enough to fill four spirit stills. Wow. So we, we quite simply, we have as many batches in a week as we have washbacks to facilitate. Okay. And that means that we have 12, 12, uh, 12 mashes, 12 distillations, if you want, every week. If I take a little look behind the company, like, of course, we, we all know behind most whiskey distilleries, there's a bigger company. And yeah. behind uh, Tomaten, there's uh, Takara, if I'm, saying, right. if I'm pronouncing that yeah, right. Takara. And if I'm looking at this, there's only one distillery in Scotland on the list for all their brands. And and one of the like the blended uh, brands that they own is uh, the Antiquary. Yeah. Um, if I hear s that you guys produce so much volume, where does it all go? Do you keep it all yourself or? So, so th this is the thing. I think what's really lovely about Tomatin, Tomatin was in the 1970s, it was the biggest distillery that Scotland had ever seen. Wow. It was the biggest malt producing distillery in the world in the 1970s. It had 23 stills producing 12 and a half million liters of alcohol a year. Now, that number has been far overtaken nowadays by likes of McAllen, Glenfiddich, Glenlivet, mm -hmm. Rosile. All of these distilleries have overtaken it. But we're going back now 50 years mm -hmm. and, and we were that big. And at that time, everything we were producing was being sold to the blended whiskey industry. Mm -hmm. But since then, we have totally changed. We've moved away from bulk production mm -hmm. to focus on our own brands. Okay. So we nowadays have 12 stills. We only use 10 of them. We we now only make, I think last year we made 1.6 million litres of alcohol. So although we're a big site, that's not a large amount of single malt when no. you look at that's it's not a small distillery but it, it probably looks at a medium yeah. um, output compared to the rest of the industry so it's not a huge amount all of that liquid services our own goals now so roughly about half of that will be with the intent to go into i, I would say maybe a million liters of that the intention is to become tomatin or kubokin single malt scotch whiskey okay the rest of that, the points, the 600,000 liters, we will use that to trade with other distilleries in order to get the malts and, and grains that we need to create blends like the Antiquary, like right. Talisman, like Big T. So everything that we're producing now is to service our own brands. All right. And that is something maybe that, that correlates to this. Um, there's one bottle of tomato behind me, and it's the 30-year-old. And to be honest with you, I was surprised at how affordable, in brackets, it is for a 30-year-old whiskey. Is this because of a, that you guys have for like 50 years this, this big capacity? Yeah, I, I think, so, I mean, again, we've not had that big capacity for 50 years. We uh, we reached that number in 1974, and then oh, by 1984, yep. we were in liquidation, and that's when we were, were bought over by Takara Schutzo. So we've done a great job of repatriating stock, and what I mean by that is a lot of the stock that we produced in the 70s and 80s was sold to the blended whiskey industry. Mm -hmm. Over the last 10 or 20 years, we've done a great job of going out to these companies and being able to get this, the, the spirit back. It's been made very easy by the fact that it has been fully matured on site at Tomatin. They 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 paid for the spirit and they also got the warehouse space. So we've been a, a doing a great job of repatriating that stock and then managing it. Uh, there's one thing that I just really want to want to ask, and this might be a silly question, but you said like because of this very long fermentation, you'll get if you give the chance to some some other microorganisms to to flourish. Other also some kind of microorganisms that give off flavors or like flavors that you don't want and is there any way of controlling it or is it just like nature that does its thing yeah so i mean th th those microorganisms certainly do exist and if you if you ever look at study bacteria and things mm -hmm. like that that can be found on on barley in water there are a plethora of things that we have to have to control yeah. we do that through temperature we do that through the mashing process um, to get rid of a lot of those things but some of them that exist on the plant are really great and beneficial for flavor mm -hmm. um, and you know i think sometimes things that in and of themselves maybe would create a negative flavor when that's balanced across the mass of the whole they can actually create really good things yeah. i mean if you take that to the maturation side of things oxidation is a great example of that where you're taking 
acids and alcohols, breaking them down, bonding them together to create really fruity and floral things. So um, butyric acid creates, uh, once it's oxidized, will create a lovely banana aroma and things like that. So yes, there are bacteria that will create bad flavors, absolutely. Our job is to control them and and make sure that they're working in a way that, that creates the best flavors. On on that yeast point of view, I did say when we started discussing that, that all, all of the distillers use loosely a, a distiller's yeast. Yep. With Kubokin um, in 2019, we did experiment with different yeast varieties. We used a red wine yeast from Australia and we used a sake yeast from Japan. So the experimentation isn't limited to just the casks that we use here. It's every step of the process we're looking at what can we do different this different. year. And I think that's why different vintages of Kubokin will be very interesting. Will be interesting to see. We finally have alcohol after fermentation and then we go to distillation. Yeah. You've talked about the, the, the condensation at a lower temperature. Is that the only difference in, in the distillation process, or do you change things up more? Yeah, so so between Tamatin and Kubokin, as well as the, the use of lightly peated barley in Kubokin, for me, one of the biggest and most influential differences on the spirit is where we take the cut point during the second distillation. So okay. we take our 8% ABV wash from the fermentation room. Mm -hmm. We'll distill that once through our wash stills, and then we'll fill that into the spirit stills to distill for a second time. Mm -hmm. And the cut points where we where we come from our four shots and into our spirit, that remains the same. So we will run the four shots for half an hour, and then we'll move to spirit. Now, where Tomatin and uh, Kubokin differ is that with Tomatin, we will take the second cut at 65% ABV. So when you're looking at spirit coming off the still, it it comes through from the strongest down to the weakest. It starts off really high strength and then gets weaker. Okay. And the higher the strength, the lighter the flavor. So at that high strength, that's where you're going to get, you know, that, that first half hour, you're going to get really, really kind of estery sorts yes. of things. And then you start to move through this fruits and floral notes and things like that. And the longer you go, the heavier the flavors get. So when we're producing tomato, we'll take that cut at 65% ABV so that the heart of the spirit that we collect is all of these fruity and floral flavors that we want. When we're coming to Kubokin, though, we'll bring that right down to about 60% ABV, so okay. an extra 5%, and that means that we're capturing more of the heavier congeners, more of the phenolic compounds in there as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a much wider spirit cut, and that gives us overall the, the average spirit is going to be heavier. It's going to have more heavy flavors in it as well. And that married with that he, that richer condensation. What I'm wondering, right? We, we I've, I've heard this before. Like the, the, during a distillation run, the flavors change. And they can change dramatically from the beginning, like from your heart until the end. What I was wondering is, first of all, like I'm not sure if this is possible in a facility uh, or like in a distillery itself, but is there a way to say like, okay, I want to take the first part, like the first half of my heart and fill it into this cask and I want to take the second part into another one? Is it possible? That's a great question. It would, it would require more vessels. Yeah. So what, what you would have to do is instead of having the two cuts where, mm -hmm. you know, you have your cut from four shots into spirit yeah. and then your cut from spirit into faints yeah. with your four shots and your faints being discarded and your spirit going on to be matured, yeah. there's no reason other than kind of capital cost and mm -hmm. space and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but theoretically, you could, during your spirit run, have spirit Multiple. one, spirit yeah. two, spirit three. As long as you had the vessel to put that first bit into, then put the second bit, and then the, the third bit, mm -hmm. um, you you could theoretically do it. I, I'm not aware of anyone that has done it. I would be really interested to see if they, they have done, mm -hmm. uh, what the results are. Yeah, Someone needs to be the first. So take this. You, you can have this free of charge, no problem. But it was <laughs> it, it was just something that I was wondering because I just I, I find that um, we, we've we talked, uh, like Lucia and I, we've talked in a, in a Dutch episode about distilling and basically explaining the whole process. And we talked with uh, Rutger, and he was a Geneva uh, distiller. And uh, he, he once demonstrated with distilling coffee that the flavors changed 
by every glass that he he distilled and he just put them into like a spiral which remind me on like the top of the cork and they and he just like this is number seven and you smell it and it's like this very heavy chocolatey notes and then you go to like number 12 and it's like this more uh, tobacco notes and then you go to number 22 like 23 or something and it's all of a sudden like this very acidic notes and i was wondering like if we if you like if we're talking about like like uh, kobakan it's 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 very experimental and this is something where i'm like this is where i feel like like a distiller makes this very really precise decision of like uh, here i want to start with my like my cuts but then like the whole middle part is just like smushed into this very one thing and i can imagine that like as you said like a very heavy peaty uh, spirit will be more subtle when you put it into new oak so if you take like the later like the last parts maybe this would have like a very surprising uh, impact and this is something i never see anyone do self as well yeah i think to go back to the kubakan spirit then if we were to take a glass when we first come on spirit mm -hmm. and then take a glass down at that 60 percent abv when we come off spirit yeah. you would have two very different spirits there. Yeah. the first one would be incredibly fruity mm -hmm. and the second one would probably be a little bit more earthy and a little bit more smoky yeah. but what we're trying to do within that cut mm -hmm. is bring all those flavors together, together. and create okay. something complex so if you go back to that example with the coffee spirit there and you've got that chocolatey one and you've got the tobacco one imagine mixing those all together exactly. the layers that you're going to get in that one spirit and i think that's what the the distiller's cut aims to do is try and is to identify what's the lightest we want and what's the heaviest we want and, bring and them then together. get them into that one layered spirit all right and um we we in in, in scotland it's usual to do it uh, two times like distilling two times um there's one disturbing that comes to mind immediately that does it three times but is that something that you guys also would be willing to experiment with like distilling kubakan like a second or like a third time we wouldn't do it with kubakan okay and the reason for that is that because it gets to those subtle. phenols those those peat elements because they are heavier compounds mm -hmm. the more you distill them the more you're going to strip them away and so we already have quite a lightly peated spirit if we were to distill that a third time i oh, think right, you would yeah. struggle to pick out any smoke that's not to say it's not something we would do as a distillery it's not something we have done and it would require a little bit of investment in pipe work and things to yeah. be able to to do it but it's not to say that it's something that we would ever shy away from if we found that there was a reason for doing that. I think one thing that springs to mind, though, is that, as I say, multiple distillation tends to strip away flavor. Yeah. Whereas the market at the moment wants spirits that are Bold. full of flavor and yeah, complex true. and have depth. So at the moment, I don't think there is a market demand for us to produce an even lighter spirit than we already do. And then we finally can put it to rest in a wooden cask and you know like mentioned like in the the, the uh, signature there are three casks bourbon casks virgin oak cask and sherry casks talk me through it like bourbon where are they from yeah so the bourbon casks that we are using we have two suppliers of bourbon casks okay um one of them is the kelvin cooperage over in kentucky okay um so they are buying casks directly from the bourbon distilleries and sending them over to Scotland. Mm -hmm. The second supplier that we'll use is the Speyside Cooperage over okay. in Scotland. Yep. Um, and that works really well because it means that if there's ever a delay in transport from Kentucky, yeah. we can go to the Speyside Cooperage and get them in the same afternoon, which is great for us. When it comes to bourbon casks, this might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but mm -hmm. we are actually looking for, and I, I think the reason it's counterintuitive is you know, when we're talking about our port casks, we're looking at casks that have held port for 50 years and yeah. we want all of those flavors of the port. When it comes to the bourbon casks, the reason we are using those casks is for the American oak influence. Okay. So we're actually looking for casks that have held bourbon for short, as short a period yeah. of time as possible. Yeah. So we're looking at bourbons that have been in the cask for three years before they're bottled. Okay. It would be a, be a wonderful marketing thing to say, you know, this whiskey's been matured in Pappy Van Winkle casks or Elijah Craig 18-year-old barrels. But the reality is those casks have already been stripped of the majority of their flavor. Yeah. So we're looking for casks that have held bourbon for three years. We want casks that have been naturally seasoned. We don't want kiln-seasoned oak. That's just going to... Kiln-seasoned has a lot more tannin in the wood. So we're wanting naturally seasoned oak. Okay. Um, 
it's going to be toasted, it's going to be charred before the bourbon producers use it, and then we want a short bur use of bourbon, and then for it to come to the distillery with all of those flavours that we expect from American white oak. What I'm wondering, and this might be like, a little harsh of a co uh, like uh, comment, but we we've been talking about like maturation of of, of whiskey in in Scotland, and it's somewhere in the 92 till 98 percent of all casks in in Scotland are currently ex bourbon casks. Yeah. Um, majority of the reasons that we as as whiskey geeks from the outside think that this is used is because it's a very cheap cask compared yeah. to like the. I can imagine that if you just a rough estimation, like how many bourbon cask could you buy from the same amount of money that this 50 year old port cask would would, would cost so that's a good way of putting it so we would probably be able to get about somewhere between three and four bourbon barrels per port cask wow okay um yeah. so a bourbon barrel will cost us between a, about 120 and 150 pound mm -hmm. um the port casks will be upwards of 700 maybe 800 pound so that's um, a very good reason to to choose bourbon from a from financial yeah but what's really interesting is that red wine casks are cheaper than bourbon barrels at the moment so okay. so it's not just a cost thing you know okay. i think the cost thing is where it stems from so okay Burb following prohibition in the united states mm -hmm. it became came law as part of roosevelt's new deal that bourbon had to be matured in fresh charred oak casks yeah um, and then the casks had to be done away with. And in Scotland, much like in the Netherlands, we love a bargain. Yeah, um, true. So it was this this idea of, you know, you can get these bourbon barrels at a great price mm -hmm. and let's use them. What's really interesting, that's around about the 1940s. Okay. The yeah. first record of Tomatin using bourbon barrels was 1911. So bourbon barrels have been used in Scotland for Long far time. longer than when they were cheap. No um, kind of at the start of the 1900s, there was, it kind of goes back to whiskey drinking mm -hmm. habits. Throughout the 1800s, a lot of whiskey was drunk in the toddy, that kind of warmed yeah. up toddy of, of drink. And that was benefited by sherry casks. Mm -hmm. But as we got into the 1900s and started moving into the 1910s and 20s, there was a move towards the highball. or, or yeah. And so it was whiskey and soda or patash, yeah. as it was called at the time. And the flavor from American oak benefited that. And so there was already a kind of move towards American oak before bourbon barrels became so much more readily available. Mm -hmm. I think then your point is absolutely correct. In the 1960s and 70s and 80s, when whiskey was being made as much as possible to go into blends, yes. American oak was the cheapest. And because the casks that were coming to Scotland had only been used for three years we could use them two or three times before yeah. we had to get rid of them. Yeah. So there was a huge cost benefit there. Mm -hmm. But looking at single malt nowadays, for me, I love whiskey matured in bourbon barrels. Um, I love all types of all, all types of whiskey, but I really enjoy up to the age of about 15 years old, a first full bourbon barrel. So um, for us, it's all about the flavor. Mm -hmm. It's just a nice benefit that they come at about a quarter of the price of a port or a sherry cask. All right, and then we got the virgin oak, which is yeah. of like European oak. Uh, so for for signature, it's American oak. All right, perfect. Okay, just American virgin oak casks. Yeah, and so we're pretty much hijacking the casks on their way into the bourbon distillery. They're the exact same; they've been toasted and they've been charred. Okay, but before the bourbon producer gets them, we buy them. Oh. Um, and ironically, they actually cost us more than a first full bourbon barrel will. <laughs> But because we're competing with the bourbon industry. Of course, and and I can imagine, like, this is what you said, like, if we buy a bourbon cask, which has been aged for, like, three years, this rough edge of the, like, the, 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 the cask is off of it. Um, yeah. th and this virgin oak is just to give this a little bit more, like, more spice, more more punch. Yeah, so what's, what's really cool is we found that virgin oak casks are really, really good when blended with bourbon casks because okay. they give more depth, they give more concentration of that spice. Mm -hmm. That said, we've done some tastings of Signature where we've done a deconstruction okay. and we've tried. So so Signature is a minimum of nine years old. Okay, um, It's a non-age dated product, but it is a minimum of nine, eight, nine years old. And so all three of those components are nine years old and we've done deconstruction tastings where we've tried the bourbon cask, the virgin oak cask and the sherry cask. 
And nine times out of 10, the favorite is the virgin oak cask. Okay. It's incredible. For me, it's almost like if you imagine what would happen if someone from the west coast of Scotland were to make bourbon. It's it's that. It's It's got all of the flavors you would expect from a good bourbon, but with that little bit of smoke from a scotch whiskey. All right. And the final one is sherry. And we have so many different types of sherry. Yeah. But what are we talking about? Is it Oloroso? Is it uh, Pix? Is it Fino? What, what, what sherry is it? Yeah, for signature, it's Oloroso. All right. And is there is there a difference between Oloroso, like Oloroso sherry from the one winery and from another? Is there a difference between it? Or do you say like it's, what is, what is, nah, let me rephrase that. If I'm taking a look at Oloroso, it is a type of sherry, but there are different wine houses that produce them. Is there for you a big difference between them? Or do you say it all gives the, the same flavors off in a whiskey? Yeah. So so for me, you're touching on now my, my second passion, which is <laughs> sherry. And I've been very fortunate to go to Hereth a couple of times okay. with some friends and spend time in the bodegas. And the, the range of flavors in bodegas in Hereth is parallel to the range of flavors if you were to go from one distillery to another in Scotland. Yeah. It's different different takes on production, different styles of maturation, different blenders doing their thing. Um, it's, it's incredible. I think sherry houses individually, their goal is to create a consistent product using that Solera system. Yeah. But what one producer's sherry all or also might be compared to the guy across the street can be very very different all right and this, this 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 combination of like bourbon virgin oak and sherry casks is blended and y you already answered like one of the big questions that i got and it was like discussing the part of like age we i've, I've in my research i've noticed that there are a lot of people feeling it well, classifying it as a younger whiskey which i feel like automatically happens when there's no age on the bottle I don't know why, but yeah. people always assume that, oh, they, they're not putting an age on it. It's probably to hide something. Is it to, to hide something or what is the reason to, to call it signature or instead of like the nine-year-old or maybe wait a year and call it the 10-year-old or whatever? Yeah, for us, it is purely freedom. Okay. Um, so signature is the only core product in our range. Mm -hmm. So there is huge importance on signature being consistent. Mm -hmm. Now... Because we're using three different cask types, each individual cask is a living, breathing thing and it will develop at its own time and at its own rate and at its own pace. Okay. So our job is to create a consistent product, but that's very difficult when the ingredients are all different. Um, yeah. So by having a non-age statement, what it allows us to do is, you know, if we've got one year where we're, we're saying, actually, this nine-year-old bourbon is a little bit light, we can add in some 10-year-old, we can add in some 12-year-old. Yeah. On the other hand, if we've got, um, it, it tends to happen more often with the virgin oak. If we have a nine-year-old virgin oak and we go, oh, good, that's that's powerful. That's a little bit too spicy. Yeah. We can then put in some eight-year-old if we need to. You yeah, know? Exactly. So it allows us that freedom. And that's the freedom that we use across the creations. So by having the whole brand as non-age, it gives us so much room. Like I say, with creation two, we used 85% of the liquid was from 2012 and another 15% was from 2014. Wow. Okay, yeah. If we put an age statement on that, we would have to have called it a six-year-old when yeah. the vast majority of it was eight years old. Yeah. Okay. And that gets that, that gap gets bigger and bigger from different products to another. You know, the creation one, the beer casks were from 2006 and the Moscatel was from 2010. So we would be calling a whiskey that was largely 14 years old, a 10 year old, you know? Yeah, so it just means for us, let the flavor be the focus. Instead of if, the age. If you want to look at that and say, it's a non-age statement, I'm going to make a tasting note saying it's young. Okay. Fine, go for it, but go with the flavor first. What does it taste like? Mm -hmm. Not, not, not does it taste like a young whiskey? And how transparent. And, and is that a bad thing? No, 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 exactly. No, it's just the, the, the thing is like, and how transparent are you about it? Like, for example, like if somebody would, would like go to Instagram and send you guys a DM like, hey, I've bought this bottle and I was wondering like how, what are the ages? Is it something yeah. that you guys can share or is it something that you say like we, we are legally obliged to say, sorry, we no, can't. We we, we will 100% share it. So I think, you know, let's, if you go back to the, the compass box thing about the age and uh, yeah. transparency, it was under EU law that they weren't allowed to say the ages of the products in the bottle mm -hmm. unless that information was requested. And okay. that's where they got to. 
Yeah. So if you come to us and say, I want to know what's in this, we will tell you the exact percentages of each cask used. We will tell you what vintage they were from. Uh, we'll tell. We'll give you more information than you possibly the, thought was imaginable. Yes. We just can't put it on the carton. Yeah. Now, if you come to a tasting with me, a mm-hmm. Kubok and tasting, mm-hmm. I'll give you all of that information right there and then. Sure. I think what's difficult is with a product like this, we rely heavily on the retailer to Tell convey the, the message of the product to the consumer. Mm-hmm. And they do a fantastic job. Retailers around the world are fantastic. But I think it's unreasonable ex- to expect a retailer to understand the exact percentages no, of this no. and then go and sell another hundred products as well. You know, no. it's easy for us to do because this is our brand. We know how it was sure. made. Yeah. So, uh, but if you come to us and ask the question, we'll give the answer. So that's also a shout out to everyone listening. Like if you buy like the, the new creations three or four, just send a message or an email or whatever. And, and, and I, I got a feeling that they really liked you to answer everything that you to, you asked them. There was one thing, there's this one word, which I always am, am intrigued about uh, when distillers or, or people working at a distillery say, and it's modern. Because okay. uh, the thing is like, I feel like whiskey is something that for a lot of people at least is something that uh, evokes emotions and, and and relies heavily on this this very big nostalgic feeling about uh, how the distillery came to be and the rich history and stuff so hearing the word modern always is like okay so we we are changing some things up and you mentioned like modern maturation yeah. what what is it so yeah i think it's it's a great question because in reality the vast 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 majority of whiskey casks that are being used today were used 100 years ago at some point mm-hmm. so what i'm what i'm keen to do is separate the word modern for innovative because okay. In whiskey, there is no re- there's not a lot of innovation. I would say, you know, using Japanese shochu casks, that was truly innovative. It was the yeah. first time it happened. We had them in stock, and then the law changed, which allowed us to use them. That's innovation. That's modern. I think it's the mindset. Okay. So the things that we're doing today by using different cask types, that's happened for 150 years. Yeah. We look at we look at warehouse books from 100 years ago. There's cognac casks in there. There's port casks in there. It's it's celebrating that that's modern. Mm-hmm. You know, a hundred years ago, there was never a mention of cask type on the bottle okay. and the influence of that. Until about the 1980s, all you ever heard people talking about was why the water source made the whiskey different. And we now know yeah. that that's not true. Um, <laughs> so so what it is, it's, it's not so much that the practice has changed. It's the celebration of it and the focus of it. What I would say is new about what we're doing is that we are marrying those flavors together. It's that final part. It's the marriage. We're using casks that have been used for a hundred years, but we're taking the information that we've learned from that. And we're then going, what's the next step? You know, sherry casks are lovely. Yep. What happens when you mix them with a bourbon barrel? That was something that was asked 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's now the, pretty much the core of all 10 and 12-year-old single malts in the market mm-hmm. is a mix of bourbon and sherry. We're just taking that and then looking at casks that maybe haven't had that question asked about them. And I think that's that's what's modern about it. Okay. But it's still, that is only possible, that mindset is only possible with a full appreciation of the history and what's gone before. There are two quick questions because... The thing is, when you're talking with somebody as passionate as you, Scott, you tend to, to you tend to forget about the time, uh, which happens to me quite too often. So there are two quick questions. The first one uh, probably won't be a quick answer, but you you, you mentioned that uh, the distillery is located way higher than regular distilleries in Scotland. We've talked about uh, maturation a lot, but this increase of altitude, how does it involve maturation? Is there a, a, a higher angel share? Is there a lower angel share? Is there quicker or slower? Like what is what is happening at your altitude? I I think the the first thing to point out is that we mature everything that we produce on site at the distillery. Okay. So we don't really have a comparison at sea level, you know. So Mm -hmm. everything that we produce is matured on site. So all I can talk about is that in itself. I can't say how that would compare. What I can say is that at at the distillery, our angel share is between 1% and 1.5%. one and 1.5 percent a year where the industry kind of averages between one and a half and two percent so it's a a a lower angel share okay um and what we have found is that 
we really benefit from long periods of maturation. We, because of our location, okay. we are able to to execute long maturation really, really well. Um, and it means that we have this wonderful process of oxidation. And so if you try older whiskies from our distillery, they don't just taste like something that's been in wood for 30 years. No. They are vibrant, they're vivacious, and it's because the distillery benefits from that longer, slower maturation. And the final question, uh, at least uh, about the distillery, we, we've we heard quite often that if you take uh, a still and you run peated spirit to it or a peated wash through it, uh, that in the next few runs, there still might be a little bit of the smokiness into it, into yeah. your final product. Is this something that you encounter with like the, the next, like the first runs of the year from Tomaten? So the reason that, that that's happening is it's not necessarily the, that the still's got a residue inside it or whatnot. It's the four shots and the faints. Okay. And it's that second distillation. So in the second distillation, you are taking the liquid from the first distillation, mm -hmm. but you're mm -hmm. also marrying that with the four shots and the faints from the previous yes. spirits distillation. Mm -hmm. So if you get to the end of a run of peated uh, production and your four shots and your faints are put to the side and they've got a, they, they have a smoky base, and then you take the, the distillation from the wash still of your non-peated and you yes. marry that, together mm -hmm. there will be that element and we call it like the shoulders and the head so um we have the shoulders going in where the first couple of runs of kubokin have four shots and faints from the last tomatin run this year though what we have done is we have run the four shots and faints right down so that when we got to kubokin we were starting with 100 that peated base mm -hmm. and i believe we've done it at the other end as well so that when we go back onto tomatin we're starting 100% at tomatin. Okay. That will mean that we incur losses um, because we're having to get rid of that spirit yeah. uh, or, or that that um, by spirit. Yeah. Um, but it does mean that we have a very clear Kubok and tomatin split. Perfect. I was just wondering that. And I wanted to, to end this whole chat with a question directly to you. If you were in charge of creations five and six and you could make anything you would want, what would it be? Uh, you'll, you'll have to wait and see. You should try Creation 3 and 4 first. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what are things like, like you've been working with this brand for so, so, so close and so much, but like what are things that, that, that you would like to, to experiment with or like what are cask types or what like things that interest you personally? It, it, it doesn't have to be into like Creation 5 or 6, but it's just what would you do? So I guess a better way to answer that, I'm driven by the, the spirit at the time of blending. Okay. Um, I've got no preconceived notions going in as to what we want to create. Really what we will do every time it comes to creating Kubokin is we will draw samples from all the variety of casks that we have. We'll sample them, we'll make our notes, and then we'll start mixing them and we'll find the right thing at that time. Okay. So I think a better way of answering that question is to tell you about the casks that we have maturing that excite me for the future. Okay. Not necessarily what it will become, but... We recently purchased some Colombian oak from the Andes Mountains. Okay. It's a different type of uh, oak species. It's called Quercus humboldtii or something to that effect. My <laughs> okay. Latin's not great. I think really that no one watching that. is very uh, very good at Latin uh, currently, so no, you're safe. <laughs> no. so really excited to see how that develops. Uh -huh. We also secured a parcel of 10 ice wine casks from a producer over in Canada, so I'm really excited to see what ice wine casks with yes. a lightly peated spirit will do. Mm -hmm. um, we have some lovely Palo Cortado casks from Jerez. Oh, wow. So I'm really wow. excited to see those. So it's really, there is what only, excites me is, yeah. the, is looking at the stock sheet and going, one day these are going to be incredible. Yes. Is that going yes. to be in time for creation five and six? I don't know. No problem. Um, I, I love it when, when the casks come together and create not just a wonderful whiskey, but a great story as well. So, mm -hmm. um, Creation 3 is a great example of that. Yes, you know, exactly. the, the the liquid, the whiskey itself is wonderful. And then it allows us to evoke that image of that Moroccan experience. So, um, so, so it's nice to have both elements, but at its core, the whiskey has to be good first. And that's a very nice way to, to end this episode. All right. I think that that's 
all we've got time for today because this is going to be a very long episode. Um, but we've enjoyed talking to you so much, Scott. Um, if you, if people want to get in touch with with you or with with Kobokan in, in, in general, visit a tour, whatever. What what can they do? Where can they find you? Yeah, you, you can find Kubokan on all the the usual social media channels. Um, Kubokan Whiskey on Instagram uh, is a great place. I think with a, a product as visual as ours, it's a great place to go and interact with the brand. And I can I can vow that Instagram is a, a pleasure to behold. Lucia, if they want to get in contact with us, where can they find us? They can find us uh, at our website, theelementsofwhiskey.nl. Uh, or you can find us, contact us on our Facebook page, Elements of Whiskey, or our Instagram, of course, Elements of Whiskey. And this is all for today. Please just go out, search for these very, very interesting, and uh, to be honest, it's a bottle that you should have at yourself just to surprise some friends with. Scott, thank you so much for your time. We are going to have a small little uh, chat and a little uh, glass before we leave. And... Uh, for everyone listening, thank you. And we have some more episodes in English at our YouTube channel as well as on Spotify. So take a look out for that. Uh, and for all our Dutch audience, thank you. And till the next episode. Cheers. Cheers.